Aside from being the Baroness of Bling, I also started this collective called Keepers. And if you guys haven't chanced upon it on Orchard Road, it's a collective that showcases Singapore designers, craftsmen and artists, right smack in the middle, opposite Robinson's and H&M. We've also got a little pop-up at Changi, and at the moment, with the support of the National Design Center, downstairs where you had breakfast is our third pop-up, and the theme is Playtime. So today, I'm going to talk about the benefits of wasting time. My uh, best waste of time has resulted in probably my most um, significant hair brain ideas, and some of them have led to life-changing events, the good ones. And um, most people in, in Singapore in particular, you know, are striving for productivity and increased production and anything that is reducing productivity is seen as bad. Well, play is seen as unproductive and sometimes maybe even a bit of an indulgence. Well, the, the thing that we've really missed out in today's age is the ability to let time fold and also ideas nourish into something important. Taking time out from being a productive member of society has led me to, I guess, the best things that I've discovered about myself. My passion as a silversmith and jewelry designer, and also my um, love for storytelling and ideas. And lastly, my passion to put Singapore on the global creative map. As life becomes ruled by numbers, um, productivity ratios, some of you talking about Excel spreadsheets for next year's targets, we've been robbed of time. And it is important to let time, you know, to think about nonsense or to do things that are not productive and let the seed of a thought of two seemingly unrelated things become an idea. And that idea to have the ability to flourish into some, some potential. So I'd like to invite you to join me on my journey to get off this expressway of productivity and um, look at how I've wasted time well. So just to give you a bit of context, um, this is my second life. In my first life, I was the managing director of MNC Saatchi. Uh, and about six years ago, I, I went on a one-day sabbatical. I call it the one day sabbatical because it's the one year that I allowed myself to do everything that I said I wanted to do one day. And um, I gave myself permission for 12 months not to be sensible and not to have to do something that would lead to something productive. And um, it was a lot harder than I thought because I, I used to sit there and go, oh, I should be at a meeting, I should be doing something. And um, I feel guilty and also everyone's like, you should get a job, you should be sensible. So I did what most sensible people would do. I got up and went traveling for 12 months. And um, that brought me to Florence. On the 11th month of my 12 months travel, I met a silversmith who taught me how to make jewelry. And that was it. I fell in love with silversmithing and that was what I said I was gonna do. I came off the airplane and I told all my friends and family, I'm now a silversmith and jewelry designer. And in July 2009, Carrie Kay was born. So for most of you, um, you probably wouldn't know this, but when I was in college, I really wanted to be a designer. And uh, my mom, being the sensible one, said, huh, design? Who's gonna pay you to design stuff for them? 
She said, go and get a sensible degree. So I did, and I graduated in a Bachelor of Science in Psychology. Not sure how sensible that was. And um, you know, it took me a while to discover the wonderful world of advertising. And um, I started in advertising as an account manager. Um, and that would be, I guess, the equivalent of sales. And there, I learned about so many things. I discovered my passion for storytelling and ideas, and most importantly, the ability to sell air. My husband always says, what do you guys do in advertising? You don't sell anything. So that is a very important trait. So it took me a while, um, and I was in advertising for 12 years, and at the age of 29, I was made managing director of M&T Saatchi Singapore. So up the corporate ladder, I crawled. But eventually, I found my spot as a designer. And that was only after my one year taking time off. So what are the things I've learned doing nothing? The first and the most important is there are benefits to not being in a rush to follow your passion. I mean, I've met so many people, my staff included. Well, Stefan's over there. He's like, I want to start a business. And I asked people why. And um, I think one of the best detours I ever took was to go via advertising. Because firstly, I was paid to make mistakes. And everything I ever learned was applied into my running of my business, Kerry K, as well as Keepers. In fact, that has been instrumental in how my brand has developed and it seeped into the DNA of the Kerry K brand. So there are benefits being a bit slow and taking the long route. I guess Kerry K is a marriage of both my core life experiences, one um, in advertising, the playful storytelling, and then the second, starting my life as um, a silversmith and jewelry designer in Florence, one of the most inspiring places to start. And that was my love for craftsmanship. So with that, it formed our brand. And we believe that you know, life is a bit too serious. So we're here to inject a little bit of uh, playful storytelling in every single piece that we design. OK, who likes Dr. Seuss? Yay, OK, me too. I love Dr. Seuss, but I only discovered him during my year off, better late than never. And the thing that I love about Dr. Seuss is the fact that he can touch on such important topics, but do it in such a playfully infectious way. And I hope that when Carrie Kay grows up, we'll be known for that too. So the other thing I learned is that you have to give yourself a bit of time to do nothing or do playful things and waste a bit of time, because that's sometimes when the magic happens. So I had, well, one whole year of um, all the time and space that I needed. Um, actually, I'll tell you a story about when I was in advertising, because I used to be the no-nonsense Excel spreadsheet queen. And um, I was completely, like, over the top. And I remember one time we had this, uh, this uh, creative trainer. He was brought in to train the agency on creative thinking. And I said, I don't have you know, a creative bone in my body. I'm the Excel spreadsheet queen. And he said, everybody is an ideas person. And creativity is like a muscle that you have to work out. But you just have to give yourself time and space to you know, turn those um, ideas into something. And the more you work that muscle, the more ideas you'll generate. So after one year of time and space, we had a flood of ideas that has now fed into all of the stories that I design into our jewelry. And one of them is called A Beautiful Mess. It's, uh, it's actually a whole collection of necklaces and rings with splats and spills. And um, it's a celebration of disorder and irregularity. In fact, it's my reaction to Singapore. Because Singapore is so neat and perfect and tidy. And um, I just wanted people to see the beauty in imperfection and disorder and to embrace the mess. So these are made of double-sided leather cut out to look like the spills and splats. 
We also decided to make a mess in Singapore. And we took the idea even with our store. So this is a picture taken by one of our clients driving past uh, the, the store. And we also created stickers in the shape of our rings, um, the spilled rings. And at that time when we launched it, it was during the whole thing with the sticker lady. So we're like, okay, bad idea. Don't want to get Singaporeans to stick things all over. So we took that to Seoul during Seoul Fashion Week. I don't think Ms. Kang, the cleaner, was very impressed, but we had fun. And then in Paris, um, I showed at Paris Fashion Week. And um, the thing that I noticed, a lot of international buyers and media, they were very surprised that Carrie Kay was from Singapore because you know, our style of playful design was not something that they associated with Singapore. They see Singapore as serious and, you know, efficient. So I thought, okay, I think I should tell the story of Singapore in a tongue-in-cheek way. And uh, what better way to do it than to make fun of ourselves? So we're known for the five C's, right? Car, cash, credit card. The last one is carrot or bling. So our ants, these three burglar ants, they don't steal sugar, they steal bling. And you can see that these characters, there's Big L, um, the lazy one with the sunglasses, always chilling, and then Big W, the one that keeps working, and Big Boss. And translated into the rings and designs of the jewelry, they're always presented caught mid-heist. And you can see the three of them running away with the gem. And you can see the one sitting on top of everyone, that's uh, Big L with his hands behind his head and the sunglasses chilling. And the burglar ants also made big news. We were invited by the Prime Minister's office to go to London to give a talk. And uh, they recently made their debut in a little filmlet. I think the last 12 months has probably been the peak of my um, ability to waste time well. I've gone beyond you know, coming up with ideas for jewelry and fashion. We even collaborated with an artist. So for this year's night festival, um, we collaborated with an amazing digital artist called Miguel Chevalier. And I picked this collection called Heavy Metal. It's um, all the gears, you can see people interacting, and the moment you walk over it, it starts to roll. And it was brilliant because I saw these serious adults walk through and they start being like, you know, little giggling kids. And when we finished this project together, I found out or I discovered that my choice of the collection was probably very apt. It's um, called Heavy Metal, but spelled M-E-T-T-L-E. -E, and it's about inner strength and not judging a book by its cover. It was suitable particularly because Miguel is an amazing, he's a genius. And he had caught on to digital art in the 70s and the 80s when computers were the size of a room. And everyone told him, what is this digital art thing? You know, waste of time, it's not art. Go do something else. But he stuck at it, and he had the tenacity. And 30 years on, he's one of the most sought-after digital artists worldwide. So the third thing I learned is, you know, sometimes nonsense takes a bit of time to present itself as an idea. And then it takes a huge amount of passion and tenacity and a lot of action to turn it into a good one. And um, I guess the seed of the idea for Keepers came during my time when I was in Florence. So that one year was very useful, all that nothing. That one year was when I met these amazing craftsmen and designers. And when you go to Florence, you can roll down any street and go into a craftsman's studio and talk to them and understand their story. And after that, the, the piece that you own of theirs, you value so much more because you understand the process and how much blood and sweat and passion that went into each piece and the story of that piece. So when I came back to Singapore in 2009, there was a huge contrast because in Singapore, everything was still cookie cutter from mall to mall, they were the same. But as I dug a bit deeper, I found out that, hey, there's a small but growing pool of incredible talent in Singapore. And the challenge was that we just had no place to showcase and everyone was just scattered all over the island. So I thought, okay, I'd like to do something about it. So in 2009, uh, 2011, I had moved into our beautiful little atelier at Newton. It's a shop house. So I made a commitment to do a quarterly showcase of independent designers, artisans, and artists. And every time you come, you would discover someone new. 
And um, since I made that commitment, we've showed every quarter. I thought, okay, I'll probably run out of, of things to showcase after a year. I mean, how much stuff is there to show in Singapore, right? But I was so surprised. Not only did I not, the, the, the kind of talent that we have now is growing. And it's even caught on the interest of Spring Singapore and Singapore Tourism Board and Design Singapore. So when they approached me, I, I pitched this idea that you know, we should change this misperception that there's not a lot of unique design in Singapore because that is not the case. It's just that people can't find us because we're in all these little nooks and crannies. And also at that time, none of the big department stores were interested in Singapore designers. So when I pitched this thought, the conversation for Keepers Singapore Designer Collective started. And um, when STB said, oh, what about these places? So I knew that the location had to be right smack in the middle, really accessible, really visible. And we found that patch of grass um, where the Singapore Visitor Center was. So that's when all the work began. And I found the most amazing pool of superheroes to make the impossible possible. Because that was an incredible idea that nobody thought we could pull off. We had 74 days to build a 4,200 square foot pop-up in the middle of a patch of grass. And you know, the architect that we worked with, Randy from Zarch Collaboratives, and Acre built the interiors. We had Arena Hogan, who are amazing builders, and then the team at the Textile and Fashion Federation, as well as the design community, came together to not only um, build this space that is in the shape of a black diamond, but we looked at all the programming and content and fellow designers that we, we felt would be a good representation of not just the diversity of design from furniture to fashion to food, but also were of international caliber that we felt would be a, a good representation. And on 12th of September last year, at 11 a.m., we opened our doors, and at 11.01, we made our first sale. So everyone who said, no, I don't think it can be done. Well, sometimes ridiculous ideas can. You just need the right people on board. Since then, we've had over 100,000 people walk through um, our doors to discover the local talent. So if you guys are not one of them, you've got one month to go, because uh, Keepers is going to be there until January 15th. Um, it was originally meant to be a five-month project, but we were invited to stay on for another year. Um, and because of the success of the response, uh, CAAS or Changi, as well as STB, uh, found us a spot at Terminal 1. So we also built the showcase at Terminal 1 until January. And the amazing space is designed by the talented team at Asylum. Um, I think the thing that kind of connects all of us who have really poured our blood and passion to keepers is this desire to put Singapore on the global creative map and also to share with fellow Singaporeans and visitors you know, that there's a lot more to Singapore than meets the eye. So the third one is uh, downstairs at the National Design Centre. And this particular one, we themed Playtime. I think the thing that probably um, I'm proudest of is not the statistics, the sales, or you know, the media coverage. Although being on MasterChef Asia with that hot chef was pretty good. But um, it, it really is you know, the fact that we've managed to discover so many amazing talent. And I'm so proud to tell their story. One of them is this, this guy called King Lai. This, has anybody heard of him? How, how many of you guys know him? So King Lai used to be a graphic designer, and he's now a full-time artist. Um, he carves all this hyper-real art out of resin and acrylic, and then he hand paints everything. This takes sometimes up to a month. When we approached him, he said, oh, I don't think I'm good enough. But we you know, badgered him until thankfully he said yes. And uh, the funny thing about him is, you know, he, he is a real character because he was like, I don't think anybody's going to buy my stuff. But he still priced it at over three, four thousand dollars, some nine thousand. And he said, Yeah, I just want to do it so people start asking me how much. And we did sell a few pieces at Keepers, and then he was subsequently picked up by K Plus, who did an amazing job because during his uh, showcase with them, he sold all twenty-one pieces. And um, he was really proud because most of them were bought by Singaporeans. And 
his story is incredible because this whole, um, well, I guess his whole new life came about because his friend challenged him to say, hey, I bet you can't you know, create art like that. And he spent three years honing his hobby into his craft and now his livelihood. And I've been influenced by a lot of people I've met at Keepers. One of them is a typographer called Mark DeWinney. And I was listening to one of his talks at Keepers and he said, you know, typography or type really does tell a story and it should add to your story as much. And at that time, I was thinking about this word that I wanted to create into jewelry, into a ring. And this word is really meaningful to me. It's um, fearless. So I thought, what would the word fearless look like? And I thought, if you, if you were going to create it into a ring, it should have a backbone, because you need to have a backbone to have courage. And it's an armor ring, so it bends. And the split is between the word fear and less, because you know, there's a fine line between being fearful and fearless. Other amazing people that I never knew existed in Singapore was this guy I met, um, Sino. Uh, actually, he calls himself I am Sino too. And he came to Keepers for an event. And I was like, oh, quickly like, checking him out on Instagram. I was like, holy cow, this, this guy does amazing work. And uh, he is a graffiti artist. Most of his commissions, uh, as can be expected, are not in Singapore, they're overseas. So he wasn't that connected with the Singapore creative community. And when he came into Keepers, he was amazed that there's this pool and this uh, community. And he said, I would love to contribute some way. And I thought to myself, hmm, we have an empty wall outside. So 19 meters by six meters, um, we got on to thinking, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if we could like, create this graffiti um, wall out in the heart of Singapore? And that's what happened. So he generously donated his time, and he created the largest piece of public art in the heart of um, Orchard Road. But the real reason I did that was because he told me the story of um, you know, when he'd been invited uh, to do a piece of art in Singapore. And because now graffiti is seen as OK because it's street art, so even the police force had commissioned him to create work in a neighborhood. But the neighborhood reported him to the neighborhood police. <laughs> so I thought to myself, what? We've become such a self-policing nation. I thought, this is serious. We have to do something about it. And that's how we got onto this harebrained idea to uh, paint the largest piece of uh, graffiti art in Orchard Road. And the response for his work was phenomenal. I mean, the guy has got 90,000 followers. Um, and I saw people stopping and talking to him because he spent two weeks. He freehand paints everything. So that's us. And that's just a little bit of what um, I've been doing whilst wasting time. So the playtime uh, pop-up downstairs is designed to be a, I guess, inspiration intermission. Because life is so compact and compressed, we wanted to invite everybody to come, spend a bit of time, you know, doing playful, silly things as a bit of an intermission, and to learn more about some of our craftsmen, some of our designers, and experience um, what I experienced in Florence. And also, hopefully, be able to unleash their inner child, much like Joanne Pei when she came and discovered us. We've got two rooms, uh, you guys might have seen. The white room is the pop-up, and that's where the entire Kerry K team has relocated to run the space, but also for us to be inspired, to meet people, and to let people see you know, design in progress. Our workshop is at the back, and we also have a fellow designer, Jody, from 77 Design. He's a yacht designer, so you can go up to him and say, huh, yacht design, what do you do? He gets a few of those questions. And, um, and the other room, the black room, we have a weekly changing selection of artists that we showcase. So today we've got Weird Country. Jasmine is probably downstairs, and she's got a very interesting perspective to share with you. So I'd like to invite you to uh, head downstairs later for, for breakfast, if you haven't already had some, and for a bit of a chat. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. But, uh, I hope I've expounded the benefits of wasting time wisely. Thank you. Come to come. Whose turn is it?
So now is the most interesting time. Uh, any questions you have? It always takes a little bit of time. Yes. So, um, how many of you are starting your own business or thinking of, you know, jumping off the corporate expressway? <laughs> well, I think it never ever um, stops. From the moment I, um, you know, decided to go on my one-year sabbatical, I always thought, is this the right thing to do? Is this sensible? And um, I was sharing with, uh, with one of the guests that, you know, you, you kind of have to suffer a bit of delusions of grandeur and believe that you can. Um, and when I started, even when I was working off my kitchen table, I always had this idea that I wanted to build Kerry Kay into a global brand. So everything that we had set out to do from day one was to scale. But the real secret is the people around you. So. One of um, the things that I'm very, very, very grateful for is I have an amazing family who would come and help and my mom ties tags, sometimes she's a security guard, my husband's a photographer and now he's been roped in to uh, be the head of, of production. I've got incredible friends. I was actually thinking to myself, who would wake up so early in the morning to come listen to me talk and half of them are my friends. <laughs> so, you know, you really do need to have these pillars and um, it, even if you're not starting your own business in life, it is so important to have the pillars that will be your, you know, sometimes the sensible one, but also the one that will just talk shit, you know, to, to poke you to say, hey, you know, you don't have to be so serious or that's not a bad idea. Why don't you try it? And I've had, you know, all those pillars in my life um, from the moment I started to either discuss stuff or bounce ideas or just sometimes, you know, be able to say, you're not insane. So, yeah, that, that's really important. Hi. Among the various things that you did when you were intentionally traveling during one year, what about this particular stood up to you compared to the other thing? So, it was the making jewelry compared to the other things. So, Someone had reminded me that uh, when I interviewed, um, when I first started in advertising, my ex-GM said, do you remember when you, know, you just started out working and I asked you if you weren't in advertising, what you would love to do? And I said, I would love to be a silversmith for my favorite designer is Elsa Peretti, um, who designs for Tiffany's. And I would love to be, to be a silversmith for her. And I had completely forgotten that I'd said that 15 years ago. So, you know, work life tends to just kind of push all those um, aspirations out. And it took getting away from it and almost, I consider it like decompressing to be able to rediscover that aspect of myself. And I think it's like riding a bike. You immediately find it. I mean, I knew when I made my first ring, I can tell you this moment. It, it's a bit of like a cliched Hollywood movie because the lady that taught me silversmithing, um, uh, Elizabetha, she had a tiny little workshop and I'd be introduced to her. I thought it was going to be a classroom and I'd have to like, I was in Florence. I had to take a train. It wasn't even in Florence, her workshop. I had to take a train, get out and then, you know, she picked me up in a little dinky car. She couldn't speak English. I couldn't speak Italian. And, you know, every day I go there and we kind of sign language. I'd be making my stuff and if anybody's worked with metal or silver, it's, it's just a you know, gray ball when you're working with it. And I remember when I was finishing that ring, it was just one of those classic moments. The rain had just stopped, the, the sun shone through, and I just finished that last polish and it looked beautiful. I had this golf ball in my throat and I was like, Wang. I was like, I want to be a silversmith and jewelry designer for the rest of my life. And it's a true story. So I was so excited. I made a friend in um, Florence and he was a paper merchant. So when I told him that, he was like, we must make your name card. And, and he was like, 
And at that time, they didn't have computers. It wasn't that long ago, but they're still a bit old school. So he pulled out this leather journal and opened the pages. And we started selecting all the typefaces. And he said, what symbol do you want? I was like, a crown. He was like, oh, crown, OK. Do you want little royalty or big royalty? Big royalty. So that's how it started. It was all a bit of a, you know, an adventure. And I just went with the flow. But back to your question, um, I guess I kind of knew inside me what I wanted. I just didn't know right in front of me. Um, and it's that journey of self-discovery that you allow yourself when you're not time compressed and under a lot of stress. And that's what, I guess, you know, giving yourself the time to do all that you know, helps you discover things about yourself that you kind of shut out during the very hectic work time and when you're responsible, especially if you've got kids, oh my gosh, no time to think, but yeah. Well, we definitely want to keep some time for you to explore. So, last question. Sorry, does anybody else want to take a question? Yes, It's true, it just takes a lot of discipline. Um, you can definitely you know, run both <laughs> parallel systems, um, but it does take a lot of discipline. And when I first started, uh, my team should not be listening to me right now. <laughs> when I first started, I had to do that myself. So um, you know, I had to you know, do all the things that required organize, planning, and then give myself time to just you know, daydream. Now, thankfully, I have other people to be organized. But yes, it is possible. OK, great. So thanks so much for those questions. And thanks so much, Sherilyn, cool. for your talk. Yep.